don't know about my grandchildren. Today is March 19, 2009. This is Judith Kent speaking from the Flagler County Public Library in Palm Coast, Florida. Joining me today is Mr. Joseph Albert Hansel, who was born on January 25, 1917. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hansel is accompanied by his wife, Libby, and our cameraman today is Dr. William Kent. Okay, Mr. Hansel, please tell me the branch of the military in which you served. U.S. Navy. Uh-huh, and I see a special... Submarine veteran of World War II. All right. That was a very elite group, wasn't it? It was. Very. Then you wear it with pride. Well, when I joined the subvets of World War II, my number was 11,979. Today, we have less than 3,000 living veterans of World War II. Is that right? I mean, we're going downhill fast. Mm. Well, you're a, tr a national treasure. <laughs> okay, why did you join the Navy? Well, I grew up during the First Depression mm -hmm. in the 30s, and I was in junior high school, and I worked for a drugstore in the neighborhood. In fact, there were two drugstores in this one block, and I worked from 3.30 3 in the afternoon till 11 p.m., mm -hmm. seven days a week. Wow. Except Mondays, uh, Sundays, I went in at 8.30 and worked till 11 p.m for the sum of eight dollars a week. Of course, my schoolwork suffered from this because I had no time to really mm -hmm. do my homework and all. And late in the eighth grade, I, t I told my father that it was just too much. And he says, if you quit, don't ever ask to go back. Of course, he opened the gate, so I went out. Hmm. which was the wrong thing, of course. My mother didn't want me down. Things were tough outside. I, I tried to get other jobs, but there weren't any. Hmm. Then I tried to get in the Navy, and when they asked me about my school education, I told them I went to senior, and I got a call from the chief to come to the office. And he says, we check on these things. And I said, well, I knew it had to be or I wouldn't get in. Mm -hmm. So he gave me a letter to take to my principal, the junior high, and have him fill it out. They sent me down to the table. I had 100 questions to do in an hour. Mm -hmm. And the chief said, in those days, they took so few into the Navy, because not many were going out. Mm -hmm. He says, you have to make at least a 70 to have a chance. So I sat down there with that pencil and pad, and I read every question twice before I put an answer down. There were a lot of, of uh, you know, some that you could, uh, what am I trying to say? selected type, mm -hmm. and I finally got through them, and the chief passed by, and he looked down, and he says, are you sure of that, and walked away. He didn't tell me the answer, but he, and I read it over, and I saw where I made a mistake. I didn't know whether I should change it or not, but I said, he didn't tell me the answer, so I changed it. When he took the paper, and he came back and laid it in front of me, at the top was in red, 99. Whoa. I really missed two, but <laughs> one. And that floored me. But it still took, when I turned 18 in January, each month I would go up to see if I was on the list. And in April, I took another friend up to join the Navy, and they were preparing about 
15 guys that were to leave the next morning for San Diego. And they had alternates, but they soon used those alternates up and the chief says, don't go away. And they took me in. The next morning I was on the train to San Diego. Hmm. So I got in in April of 1935. I wanted a battleship or a heavy cruiser. They sent me to a four-stack destroyer, <laughs> one that had been built during World War I. Mm. I spent four years on three of them. Later I was on a, a uh, patrol craft in the, in the Caribbean, and I got my wife and son down to Panama, to Puerto Rico. He was about six months old. In fact, he learned to walk, and when Pearl Harbor got hit, they took all the Navy wives and children and put them on a New York Puerto Rican steamship and sent them to New York. Mm -hmm. After they were gone, I didn't want to stay in the Caribbean, so I volunteered for submarine duty. Mm -hmm. So they sent me to the air station for a real rigid examination eyes, teeth, everything. I passed that and it wasn't long after my request went in that I was sent to New London, Connecticut to sub-school. Hmm. And then from sub-school they sent me to the Pacific and from the Pacific there I was sent up to Dutch Harbor up in the Aleutians. I was in a relief crew and when a sub came in from a war patrol, the crew would go to the barracks for a little relaxation mm -hmm. and the relief crew would take over. We would clean up the boat, we would fuel it, bring provisions aboard, fix any jobs that needed done, mm -hmm. and get the boat all ready for the next patrol. The S-34 came up from San Diego and I knew the chief on there and I asked him to get me aboard. And the executive officer says, we have a full crew, we, the only way we could take you is as an oiler. I was an engineer. I was a first class motor machinist mate at that time. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't qualified in submarines. So I was nothing. Mm -hmm. When you're not qualified, you were the lowest thing on that boat. By qualified, you don't mean you didn't have the skill. You That's mean right. You didn't have the credentials. And it takes anywhere from six months to a year to get qualified. Because mm -hmm. they take you through the boat, and every compartment, you've got to know everything about that compartment, how to rig it for dive, what, what you should do in case of a damage. Mm -hmm. If you're a radioman, you still have to know how to fire a torpedo out of the tube. Really? Oh, yes. A radioman or a cook would have to know how to go into the engine room and start the engines. So you'd have to know the whole boat, mm -hmm. every compartment, regardless of what your rate was. Mm -hmm. So I made this war patrol, and we had a lot of difficulties. We were in the Sea of Oshwish, northern Japan. We had to stay submerged 18 hours a day because it didn't get dark till 10 mm. and at 4 a.m. it was light again. So we only had six hours on the surface to charge our batteries. And when we did charge them, we only had two engines. We had to kick the tail shafts out so we just lay dead in the water in those heavy seas and we rolled and pitched mm. for six hours. Being an engineer, as those batteries heated up, we sucked all the hydrogen gas into the engine room and they would go in the engine and out the exhaust. But standing there between the engines for those six hours, you're breathing that hydrogen gas. When it gets to 3%, it becomes explosive. And during the years of the submarine Navy, they've had quite a few battery explosions and it's taken lives and all, mm -hmm. done a lot of damage. 
Also, we had to take our air for the engines down the conning tower hatch, through the boat, through the after battery, to the engine rooms. So when they laid dead in the water up there, the skipper would usually have his foot on the hatch. And when a wave came over the bridge to keep from flooding the control room below him, he slammed the hatch shut. The engines are still running, where we would suck all the air that was in the boat <laughs> until he took his foot off that hatch and it was spring loaded so it would fly open and we'd suck that cold air again, then back down again. Wow. So, <clears throat> okay, before we go on with more of that, yeah. let's get the big picture. You were in from 35 to 56 to, th through World War II all the way to 56. Wow, it's quite a career. And your rank? So after the war, we went back to Connecticut. Mm -hmm. But what was your rank? Well, when the war ended, I was a warrant machinist, mm -hmm. warrant officer. But they don't, they don't have warrant officers on submarines. Oh. Once you make a warrant officer, you go to a tender or another ship or a base or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You don't stay on submarines. Hmm. So when I was a warrant officer, I was still aboard. And the captain asked me whether I wanted to be a chief warrant or an ensign. And I said, well, I want to stay on the submarines. I don't want to go to a base. Mm -hmm. So they recommended me for ensign, but the exec didn't let me stay in to get a night vision test. And the Bureau came back and says, without the night vision test, they couldn't do anything about my appointment. Well, the war was winding down about this time, and it did end. And the captain says, what do you want to do? I said, I want out. I had 10 years in the Navy. So I was put out. We went back to Baltimore. I went to work for Lever Brothers six days a week, which I didn't care for. I joined their union. And they came around Saturday and they says, Sunday we have a meeting uptown. I said, I have other plans for Sunday. He says, if you don't show up, you'll be fined. I didn't go. Monday they came around and they says, being a veteran, just back from the war, we're going to overlook it this time. <laughs> I took the card and tore it up and I handed it to him. I went down to the office, to the personnel department. I told him, as the end of the month, have my check made out. I'm finished. Well, you don't want to quit. I said, will you give me a pension 10 years from now? No. I said, Uncle Will, my 90 days weren't up yet. So I went, went to Washington to the Bureau, and I got myself shipped back into the Navy without losing anything. Okay. And they sent me back to New London, the submarine force. I volunteered for two years. We went to Panama after the war for two years. Hmm. I came back to New London, became an instructor in submarine school for three years. Hmm. Then I rode boats on the river like a submarine rescue vessel. I was on, in the engineering department on the sub base, the repairs of subs. Then I went to a submarine tender in New London. And I spent about four years on it until 56 when I retired. Hmm. The day after I retired from the Navy, I went to work on the submarine base in civil service. Did you? For another 20 years. <laughs> All I did was change uniforms <laughs> from a Navy uniform to a civilian clothes. Hmm. I talked to the sailors daily. I helped them find parts for their engines or whatever. So I spent another 20 years civil service. You really saw an evolution in the technology, didn't you? In, yes, in the because, particularly. because in, the, in 50 we took the Nautilus aboard our squadron to the submarine tender, the Fulton. Mm -hmm. So she was our boat mm -hmm. in the squadron. And then after that, 
all these fast attacks and boomers. And I had a job at the base. I'm going to say SOPM. That's Supply Operations Assistance Program. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and after the boat had been in commission three months, we took all their parts aboard and went through them. In the meantime, when they went back to the builder, the electric boat company, they removed certain pumps or engines or whatever, different equipment, mm -hmm. and put new type on. So we had to change all the spare parts. Take the spare parts off for the ones that they took out and get new parts for the ones they put aboard. And combine yeah. all that within three months. Mm. So how, it was how, a job. How did you keep learning about the new technology and the new equipment? And the equipment? Well, that, that was something too because the spare parts were all under H cognates where the other materials were under a different cognates. So the nuclear parts had to be kept separate hmm. from the other parts. So it was a learning experience it was. the whole time. It was. It, it? it kept me busy. I bet. I, was the, I became the uh, uh, supervisor of the soap team mm -hmm. at the sub base. And I held that position till I retired. When I retired from civil service, I took my Navy time and used it with my civil service time and took one retirement, mm -hmm. civil service time. But I have a ID card, you know, from the Navy that I, I rate going to any base and uh, commissary mm -hmm. exchange. I don't lose anything from that at all. Excellent. I don't get paid by the Navy, I get paid by mm -hmm. civil service. Okay, let's go back now to your wartime experience. Um, you were in combat. Yes. Talk, talk about that a little bit. Well, on this patrol on the S-34, we were in the Sea of Oshawish and like I say, our port motor shorted out. And it was in the middle of the charge around midnight. So for three days and three nights, we operated with one motor, one shaft. We still had to stay submerged 18 hours a day with one shaft moving. When we surfaced, we only could charge with one engine and one generator. And they worked, electricians worked on that motor. They had a horrible job, but they did fix it. Hmm. They fixed it which was unbelievable. And when we reported that the motor had been fixed, they sent us a five-day extension on, on charge there. So we were almost out of fuel and food by that time anyway. So we limped into Hat 2, which was one of the islands not too far from Dutch Harbor mm -hmm. that the Japs controlled and they sent army people up and they had a way to shore in that ice water and they were in leather boots. Their feet froze, oh. a good majority of them. They had more damage from that than they had from the enemy. Mm -hmm. We pulled into that too a few days after our, our forces had secured the island. They were still hunting a few Japs up in the hills. Mm -hmm. And we spent three days in there waiting. The Japs were supposed to come back to take the island over, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. But we did take on some fuel and some supplies from an old freighter that showed up there <laughs> and got us through that. What was your specific job during that time? Running the engines, repairing them. Mm -hmm. I spent all my time in the engine room, so those 30, 35 days that we were out, I never saw the sky. Really? Never. I lived the, like living in a tin can. Mm. Was, was that difficult? I mean, how no. did you get along with the no, other I, people? 
I love the duty. Mm -hmm. I love the duty. How about your depth charging? Oh, there were about 55 crew members. This boat is only 219 feet long. Mm -hmm. There were 55 people aboard. We didn't have a shower. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh no, this, this, this boat was commissioned in 1922. There were no showers. You had a hot bunk. In other words, three men were assigned to two bunks. So while one guy was on watch, two guys were in the rack. Oh, you took turns. So one guy gets up to relieve the guy that was on watch. He comes back and climbs into the hot bunk. The condensation inside the boat was from that cold water outside and the heat from inside, what little bit we had. The top bunks, the guys used to have to rig canvas up there to keep from getting a shower. So you can imagine living in a hall like that for 30 to 35 days mm -hmm. with, the, with the, uh, those conditions. It was pretty tough to stay healthy. I guess. But we ate well. Did you? Submarines always fed better than any other ships in the Navy. Is that right? Oh, they got the best because we didn't need the extra weight with bones and all, so all of our meat was prepared without the bones. Hmm. And we got the best. Sounds like you deserved it. <laughs> I served, like I say, on destroyers, and we were alongside of the docks. We never had fresh milk. Hmm. They made clem, that powder milk. Mm -hmm. That was horrible. That was horrible. Our food on the was terrible on those destroyers. But submarines, they were feeders. They were feeders. <laughs> How did you keep in touch with your family during that well, period? <laughs> to begin with, while I was on destroyers, a friend of mine wanted me to go to Baltimore to his home for a New Year's leave at a week. I came from Texas. I couldn't go home. I didn't have the money. He said, I'd get you a date with Libby Brown, lives around the corner. And I, he was a crazy little Irishman, you know, angry. And I figured, a fellow stiller, if ever there was one, you know. Mm -hmm. So one day to shut him up, I says, okay. We went to his home, his family were terrific. They took me in like I was one of the family. They were great. The next evening we went around to her house. My Amy knocked on the door, and Mrs. Brown come to the door, and she says, What do you mean bringing a sailor around here for my daughter? Uh, I was ready to run then. But they had a thing between them that they yakked one another. So we were invited in, and I'm sitting there, and them two were having at it. And then there was a click, click coming down the steps, you know, and I looked up and I said, Nah, it must be her sister or somebody. <laughs> It was her. She had eight brothers. Oh boy. She was the only girl. So, from then on, whenever the ship was in Norfolk, Amy and I, we would hitchhike from, Baltimore, from Norfolk to Baltimore. That's about 250 miles each way. Mm. On a weekend, just to be up there with the girls. Mm. Well, we went together for, she was my first and last blind date. We went together for a year and a half before we got married. And we got married in 39. Oh. And, and you didn't tell her about the time you were depth charged so badly. On that patrol where we burned out the motor, we had a uh, freighter in sight with a patrol craft. We got in, we got a shot at the freighter. But the patrol craft worked us over. The old S boats were good for 200 feet. Now that's about 200 feet, that's about 88.8 .8 pounds per square inch bearing on you. And they figured that's, that was about all our hull could take. Now we were riveted, we weren't welded. 
hole was riveted. Mm -hmm. The depth charges were forcing us down. We had an up angle, but we were going down because it mm -hmm. going off above us kept pushing us down. We were getting close to 300 feet. Oh boy. So the pressure was increasing. The hull, the shape of the hull was changing. We had leaks we never knew we had before. Mm. And when those charges went off, everyone on that boat was... There were no atheists aboard then. I had to do something. I was, I was down in the, in, in the villages with a wrench tightening the packing land on some valves that were leaking. But I didn't want to tighten them too tight where I would snap the stems off. Mm -hmm. But I had to do something. I just just couldn't sit there and just listen to that. Right. The light bulbs would shatter. The cork inside of the inside of the boat would fly off the hull like snow. Mm -hmm. And it was scary. It was very scary. Mm -hmm. He said you weren't afraid. <laughs> you were fibbing because you were. Because you didn't know where the next one was going to light mm -hmm. or f explode. And it did enough damage as it was. It scared the heck out of all of us. Okay. <clears throat> so, but we got away with it. And we got through it. it it's, it's something you won't forget. No. But you don't want any more of it. Was that was that your worst moment? Yes, yes. Between that and that motor burning out mm -hmm. in their backyard and the depth charging, yes. Now were you writing home and telling her about this? You couldn't. You couldn't. She didn't know where I was at. She had no idea where I was at. She knew I was in the Pacific, mm -hmm. but she had no idea. When I wrote her a letter, I said to her, if you don't hear from me for a while, don't think anything of it. That's all I said. Mm -hmm. They checked your mail and they cut all that out of there. When she got her letter, it looked like it went through a shredder. <laughs> what they would cut out. But I said nothing where I was at or what I was doing. Not a word. Loose lips sink ships, right? <laughs> and yet they, they stripped it. Uh -huh. But. Then he went to San Diego, but he was out most of the time. But when he went to San Diego, I took the baby, got a train, and went across country. Oh. So they, yeah, we, they sent us from the, from the emotions back to San Diego, and we operated with sound school. Mm -hmm. We would go out Sunday morning around 7 a.m. and we would go out to station and there would be these small craft out there with sonar people aboard. And we would dive to 100 feet and we had a buoy on the surface with a cable. And we would operate in a certain section because there were four or five other subs out there doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And these patrol crafts running around on the surface trying to find us. Hmm. It was to train them. Okay. And once in a while they would cut across and cut our buoy hmm. and then we'd have to surface and put another buoy up. Mm -hmm. And we were at 100 feet the morning that President Roosevelt passed away hmm. because the escort ship sent us the word down and the captain says ask for a for a uh, re repeat. So they send it again. And the captain says, oh my God, we got a haberdasher for a president. Mm -hmm. Meaning, Truman. Uh, what was it, Eisenhower? Truman. Truman. Truman, Truman. Truman yes, Truman. Mm -hmm. And he was worried about that, you know. Mm -hmm. But as far as I'm concerned, he turned out to be a a doggone good president, mm -hmm. after all. So was that the end of your combat experience? Yes, it he, was. He would be gone all week, 
But we operated from Sunday to late Friday evening. We'd come in Friday evening, and if you had the duty, well, you stayed aboard and went back out again Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had problems out there too with uh, engines and so forth, and they were old. And they, they, they couldn't take much more. When the war ended, they sent them up to uh, Frisco up there to a yard and most of them were sold. The boat I'd been on, the 34 boat, sold for, what was it, about $9,000. <laughs> you know, they cut them up for mm -hmm. scrap and all. There's a lot of uh, brass, aluminum, I'm not brass, and copper mm -hmm. aboard them and things like that that can be used. But uh, they scrapped them all. They never kept one of them for later years. Now we have a lot of fleet boats. Now the fleet boats were 314 feet long. They were much lar larger. They could stay they could stay out for 60 days or more hmm. on patrols. And they could go a lot deeper than we could go. Hmm. Some of them went to 600 feet or so during the war. And uh, they carried a much larger crew. Some of them carried anywhere from 70s to 80 people. They had showers, but they couldn't use them. <laughs> they had them filled with uh, food and such, <laughs> canned goods, so they could stay out that long. Wow. Oh yeah, they were a lot better boats. Mm. They were, they were great. But we lost 52 of our submarines during the war. Did we? And with those 52 submarines, we lost 3,600 submariners. Mm -hmm. Now these are people that were lost due to combat, combat. efforts. Mm -hmm. If you were home on leave and got killed in an accident, you were not listed on our uh, wall of fame. Mm -hmm. Now New London was the eastern uh, A memorial that we had. And we had a chief that started the project to build a wall and put every name of every submarine, submariner that was lost during World War II on that, on that wall. Mm -hmm. I have a picture of it in my book here. All the money came from companies, individuals, throughout the country. They raised more than enough money to build this wall with all those names engraved on it and a little money left over to go towards keeping it restored. Mm -hmm. They did that well. Right. Uncle never paid a dime towards it. Hmm. So today that's the Eastern Memorial. They have one on the West Coast and it's, it's quite a sight. Um, speaking of that, uh, I noticed uh, when you were listing the medals and awards that you received, that mm -hmm. there were some interesting items there. Uh, I wonder if you'd say something about the combat the pin and the submarine dolphin. To get qualified in submarines, I told you how to go through the boat and be checked out. Mm -hmm. Then you got your dolphins before you couldn't wear them because you didn't earn them. Mm -hmm. And once you got them, you were responsible to doing your job. And if anything happened that you didn't, you would be disqualified, sent to surface craft, and you would never go back to the submarine Navy. Wow. The crews on the submarines were a tight group. Teamwork. You never heard anybody, you know, getting shook up. And when I was on the surface ship, we had the engineers and the deck force, and they never got along. Huh? They were always quarreling, but not on the submarine. The crews fit together. The camaraderie was also oh, with the wives. With the wives too, they all joined together. It's a tight group. 
So the yeah. submarine dolphins or your pride, mm -hmm. that is it. Then came your combat pen. If you made a war patrol and it was a successful war patrol, you got a combat pen. And the more patrols you made, the more gold uh, stars you got in it. For ever so many patrols, you get a gold star. And they, some of them made 11, 12 or more patrols on those fleet boats. Mm -hmm. They did good. They got a lot of ships. Out of the 52 submarines we lost, we got over 50% of all the ships that were sunk during World War II in the Pacific. Is that right? We got over 50% hmm. with the small group that we had. We were the smallest group in the Pacific, fighting group. Hmm. And yet, like I say, we, we got over the 50%. Mm -hmm. You have some interesting but of all the medals, I always considered the victory medal that everyone got after the war, because everybody got it. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the greatest of all of them. The Asiatic Pacific and all these others, uh, you were in that area. Mm -hmm. But the victory medal, that meant, meant something. It was over, you know. All those years, it's finished. And all the shipmates that you lost comes to an end. You're not going to lose any more. But this was for those chief. Mm -hmm. And it, after I went out of the Navy at the end of the war, I went back to Chief Petty Officer. And I stayed at it. They told me if I wanted the warrant rack, I would have to request it. And I says, no, I want to stay in the submarine force. And as a chief petty officer, I'm satisfied. Mm -hmm. So I stayed as a chief till I retired. And then when I had 10 more years in fleet reserve, they retired me on the Navy listing as a warrant officer. Mm -hmm. But there are no more W01s. That was the lowest warrant. There are no more. Mm -hmm. As a warrant officer, you can't go to the Chiefs Club because you're no longer a chief. <laughs> you can't go to the Officers Club because you're not a commission. <laughs> and they don't have no warrant officers, O1 clubs. So you're out in left field without a glove. <laughs> you're nothing. You're nothing. You really are. You're nothing. But I, some... I still feel that I'm a chief petty officer, period. Did you have some other things you yes, wanted sir. to show us? Yes. Uh, well, oh, it's the one thing here. Uh, My son, he was still active duty when this was taken. My grandson, standing behind us, was a midshipman at the Naval Academy. And I was already retired at that time. But I put my uniform on when my son had that picture taken of the three of us. Father, son, and grandson. Three of us. Lovely. Now my grandson, did five years in the Navy, and they let him out because the Navy shrunk. Mm -hmm. Today, he's an FBI agent. Oh, wow. Yes, he is. So the Navy has done well by you and mm -hmm. vice versa. Huh? Yeah. This was the first ship I served on, the Stephen Decatur, <laughs> 341. See those stacks. <laughs> that was a... Four stack destroyer. <laughs> this was taken on in the uh, the um, what do you call it? Submarine, the lone sailor. Uh, 
that they have in D.C. Mm -hmm. That's part of that. Have you ever been to the Lone Sailor? No, I haven't. It's quite a thing to see. It's wonderful. This is our Wall of Honor in Groton, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. That has all the names of all the submariners that were lost during World War II. Elegant. It's beautiful. This is a picture of us at one of our submarine veterans affair mm -hmm. that we were we attended. I was going to ask you about that. You now, have been involved in veterans affairs. We have Every year we have a national convention somewhere in the United States. Mm -hmm. We've had them in Norfolk, we've had them in San Diego, we've had them in uh, uh, Salt Lake City, we've had them in uh, Texas, Texas, <laughs> in the San Antonio, we've had them in uh, Las Vegas. <laughs> Las Vegas. Every year. Last year we were in uh, Kentucky. Kentucky. Uh, where the race is Louisville. Are. Louisville. Mm -hmm. And this year is going to be in uh, Green, Green Bay, Bay Wisconsin. Wisconsin. <laughs> if we're healthy enough, we're going to go. Good. <laughs> so, uh, and 210 is going to be in Cleveland, Ohio, and it's probably going to be our last one. Hmm. We're getting so few that. It's well, tough. Any of us left. <laughs> tough for the, to get anyone to run them. Mm -hmm. And without a crowd, you don't get very good rates at the hotels. That's true. And the ours usually run a week. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have another organization that's called the Subvets Inc., which are any submariners that are qualified in submarines can join this club. And they're all over the country. They're a huge organization. The younger group, much younger. Most of us WW2s belong to their organization also. Mm -hmm. They are taking over all of our uh, uh, memorials, memorials Good. and running them. Good. They will keep them up because mm. we're not able to anymore. So they have taken over our memorial in Groton. And they hold the services every year there. Good. And they're great. Mm -hmm. They do a great job. How about uh, locally? You're, you've been involved locally with the group. Oh, yes. Well, here, our nearest one is outside of Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a little far to go. No, I was me. thinking of MOA. MOA? Oh, yes. yes, I belong to MOA here with mm -hmm. <laughs> Billy. Yeah. He, he, it's my problem. <laughs> this is our, every couple of months they put this out. This is national. I just wanted to show you that there's three pages of sailors rest your oars. Mm -hmm. And these are some vets who have passed away in the last couple of months. Okay. And every, every other month when they put that magazine out, there's usually two or three pages that shows you who they are, what boats they served on, and what state they, they were in. Mm -hmm. But uh, Time marches on. Huh? Yes, it does. That's why we're going down the hill so fast. Mm -hmm. Did you have a picture of his first boat? Yes. The picture of the, the uh, destroyer. No, no, the boat. The, the, the summary. Oh. I don't. I bet I didn't bring one. Did you, did you tell us? Did you tell us the name of the S? The S thirty four, and the hull number was SS one three nine. That meant it was the hundred and thirty ninth submarine built. Hmm. I was on the S thirty two, and the hull number is. 32137. That is my uh, 
address uh, code number, oh. local code, 32137. Mm -hmm. And I was on the 32 and it's 137. That's I can't forget that. No. <laughs> these, in the book, these were the names on that, uh, on the, uh, oh, memorial. 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 It was into the stone. Every one of them. Uh, I should have had a picture of that old S boat. I mean, uh, I didn't bring one. I, I think it's interesting that your son um, and grandson would want to follow in your footsteps. They must have had a good experience as a part of a military so. family. Yes. Well, my son grew up in the Navy, for one thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And when he went to the Naval Academy, when he graduated, I says, don't go in the submarines because I was in it. You might not like it. His was the first class that went directly from the Naval Academy to sub-school in New London. <laughs> Normally, you'd have to go to sea for two years before you could put in for sub-duty. Sub <laughs> but he went direct. Then they sent him to Key West to the Grenadier for three years, and he went from an ensign to a full lieutenant in three years on that boat. Good for him. Then he went to a boomer, a new boat. But he did almost 30 years in the Navy and retired as a captain. Good for him. Oh. I guess you're pretty proud of him. Yes, yes, he, he did it the right way. Mm -hmm. well, he had the smart sport and all. And he did well. And he had the support yes. to be able now, to. Now, Lib in Groton, she went to, she was a volunteer at the Navy Relief hmm. at the sub base. And even after I retired, I would take her in Wednesday mornings and leave her off there, 7.30, and pick her up later in the day. Hmm. She did this for 37 years. Then she got maculin, first in one eye, and a year later, the second eye, and she's legally blind. She has a little, uh, what do you call it? I have a little vision. Out of the side, you know. Side. Yeah. I have to get her in. <laughs> and what, so, what was your job there? At, well, I was, <clears throat> I was an interviewer for people that come in need help. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, their teeth were bad, the children's teeth, or, or they were out of food, or they had to pay rent, and I would interview them and, and we would assist them in some way. Then I began training new people mm -hmm. to come in to do the job. I worked, well, when my, I didn't go back to my normal job until our son was in high school and I went back to work as a uh, interviewer and uh, not at the Navy Relief but at a, uh, a book company and then I worked at the Superior Court in New London in the Family Relations Department. Mm -hmm. And when I was 50, I said, it's time to quit and, and do something. Mm -hmm. So that's when I went volunteering. volunteering. Mm -hmm. So you were saying that the, not only the, the submarine people yeah. were tight and supported one another, but the families as well. The families, yes. Mm -hmm. We lived in Navy housing for about eight years. And then when, uh, just before he retired, we bought a home in Groton and moved into it. Our son was in high school at that time. Mm -hmm. but, uh, we lived in Groton for 57 years. <laughs> <laughs> she was from Baltimore and I was from Houston, but we liked it up there. Mm -hmm. The only reason we we're down here is my son lives down here. Mm -hmm. And he wanted us down here where he'd keep an eye on us <laughs> because up there we had no family. No yeah. more family. And if either one of us went in the hospital, he would fly up. Mm -hmm. This way, he doesn't have to make them long trips anymore. So, I didn't want to come down here. 
then I got to thinking, if anything happens to me with her condition, mm -hmm. she got her off down here. That's my driver. <laughs> well, you two have been a team for a long time. Oh, yes. Year. How many years is it? We've, we made, we made two trips to Jacksonville to Mayo Monday and Tuesday of this week already. Mm. I had been married. I had an eye bothering me. Sixty-nine years. Sixty-nine years. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, I went up and checked the eye. And we both had an appointment yesterday, Tuesday, Tuesday, with our doctor up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. You know, when we first came down, my son got us an appointment with him. And he was in St. Augustine at the time. Then they transferred him to Jacksonville. And we thought it over, and we figured, well, we like going to him, so we go to Jacksonville. The 5th of, of January, I turned in a 2007 car and bought a 2009. Got me a new Buick, Lucene. The other one I had was what, the LaCrosse. And that car bugged me. I, it just wasn't right, you know. To what do you attribute your long life and your mental acuity? <laughs> My take her care of there. No, she <laughs> do you take go. care of each other. You take care of each other. <laughs> We've never walked out the door, ever, or anything, you know. We've never you had have to, a kiss in the morning and a kiss at night. Never go to bed mad. Uh, never go to bed angry at each other. Never had a problem. Never. 69 years. <laughs> if you were giving advice to a young person today and they were considering the Navy, what would you tell them? Oh, by all means. The submarine navy today is wonderful, clean. The air you breathe in that submarine is better than you can breathe outside. Really? They make their own oxygen. They clean their own air. They're they're in these jumpsuits. They're nice and clean. They make more fresh water than they can use. Mm. You can take a shower anytime. They they are just excellent. They are beautiful. And like my son was on a boomer, they stayed submerged 60 days. They never surfaced for 60 days. Mm -hmm. And they're out there playing with the Russians, you know, hide and go seek games, you mm -hmm. know. This went on constantly during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And there's many good stories to that too, you know. But uh, they kept them wrapped up. Mm -hmm. they did. But, uh, the Navy as a whole today is so much different. And it's a lot different now. These young kids, they ship them in married with a family. Yeah. They don't make enough money That's to really take to care Navy of them. Mm -hmm. That's where the Navy relief comes in. When I was in the Navy, you couldn't get married unless you were a second class petty officer. Right. And you had to have permission from your commanding officer. Didn't know that. That's right. You had to have permission from the commanding officer of the ship you were on to get married, and you had to be second class petty officer above. So you had now to that, be responsible. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that pay wasn't much in those days either. Second class petty officer, I think it was about $54 a month. Of course, when I went in the Navy, I was getting 21 <laughs> You know, when they had the recruits come to Groton, the older group that have a club there invite them over and serve them a meal. And the idea is that the older men can talk to these young recruits. Mm -hmm. And this one young boy that sat with us, he talked to us for a while. And he was amazed that we were married so long. <laughs> and he said, what do you attribute it to? So I told him just what I told you. And he just sat there and thought, well, I guess that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he will take it. <laughs> Act on it. No, we have nothing to growl about. Mm -hmm. you know? 
Yeah, we don't have any worries. Of course not. We both grew up during the Depression years and all. Everything we bought after we got married, we had to buy on time because we had no bank account to begin with. <laughs> but even today, what we have, we appreciate. We owe nothing. We have no bills. We, we're not over our head. We get enough retirement to keep us going. I've always been very thrifty, mm -hmm. and he can tell you, I was taught to save before you spend, mm -hmm. so, so that's what I attribute our long life together to. Okay, I'm afraid we're running yeah. out of time. Well, Is there anything else you'd like to add? Oh, I think, <laughs> I think we fell the bill. Well, we appreciate so much you sharing your story. It's very well, unique. <clears throat> Billy got us hooked up last year with that radio station they had, and he had five of us come in, and we sat around, and he went around, and he talked to each one of us separately, you know, we were all in, in the Army, and the Navy, and Marines. Mm -hmm the whole works, you know, and he got a little bit out of each one of us as he went around, you know. Well, we thank you very much. Well, you're more than welcome, I mean.